Blue says, didn't Truman tell off Oppenheimer? You didn't give the order. I did. Get this Creighton out of here. Something like that. Yeah, we'll come back to it. I will analyze uh, Oppenheimer. Not as good as Barbie. Amazingly. Amazingly for me as a fan of Christopher Nolan, uh, I, I consider him the greatest director in the history of cinema. But uh, with Oppenheimer, it's not that it's bad. There's all sorts of good things, but for every good punch of Oppenheimer, um, there, there's something missing in this movie. There, there are opportunities that were not taken. And they're almost in the movie. This movie almost gets to what it should be. It's a very good, very well-made movie, you know, for, for an administrative thing. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't channel the greatness of an epic scientific movie. Uh, it, it is uh, almost too technocratic, too politics, too much politics, too much details. Uh, and Richard Spencer has uh, fully captured this in his uh, Substack post about this. Uh, the problem is that there's too much. Christopher Nolan gives us a little bit of everything. Um, but it's too packed. It's too long. There's too much detail. There. I mean, the whole thing after the Trinity test, the whole movie is completely useless. I'm sorry, I'm feeling like I want to sneeze, but I'm... I'm not sneezing. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I get to sneeze. So yeah, uh, it's like a whole hour after the Trinity test, we get to see um, just administrative concerns and the, the American state going after Oppenheimer for collaboration with communists because he fucked a communist. Uh, it, it's all very small. It's like, I, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about any of this, but Oppenheimer cares. Christopher Nolan care. And it's <laughs> why, why didn't we focus? And especially, you know, in the fall of the show, why, why, would, why would that be the whole ending? Like a one-hour uh, expose of the whole network of betrayals behind Oppenheimer at the bureaucratic level. Who cares if this motherfucker doesn't have his security clearance anymore? It's like, oh my God, a Jew has lost a security clearance. There's 99 other Jews that will have their security clearance, but they were not the right Jew. Oppenheimer should have been the Jew who had the security clearance. It's... Uh, it's extremely painful to see all this when you know that basically the ideological descendants of Oppenheimer have taken over the intelligence apparatus of the United States, have used it to their ethnic interest. There is much of the Jewish question coming in this. All right, so my view on Oppenheimer, the movie by Christopher Nolan. I should be a fan of this movie because I am an extreme fan of Christopher Nolan. I consider him one of the greatest men in cinema. He, always, he often uses the same actors as this guy. Uh, we see the return of the Ukrainian, of Tenet. We see a lot of familiar faces from the movies of Christopher Nolan. And uh, he realizes here a movie that is totally outside of his usual style. No science fiction, no embedded system, although he did take some of his ideas of embedded, reverted narratives. Uh, he, he put them as much as he can, but in a very historical, biographic movie. I was extremely worried seeing Christopher Nolan temp tempted by the historical biographic type of movie, because it's a harder movie to make interesting. Because when you want to stick too much to the reality, the reality is always a little bit more disappointing 
than a script that you could have come up with. It's very rare that reality and all of its details and all of the required things that need to be laid out on the screen for this to be a historical movie. All of this combined uh, makes the, the making of these movies much harder than a perfection movie because the perfection movie, you can make the script super clean. It seems here that the job of doing a history movie for Christopher Nolan really hit him hard and that it, it made him incapable of expressing his usual genius. Uh, he found a way to make a historical movie with an inverted storytelling narrative. The inversion comes as follows, and spoiler alert for those who haven't seen the movie, it reveals the end of it. So the way he arranged it is that the movie builds up a conflict between scientists, between Oppenheimer and some other scientists, uh, on the basis of a secret conversation that would have happened uh, between Oppenheimer and Einstein. And as the other scientist comes close, Einstein see, is seen walking away with a great despair and disappointment in his eyes, you know. And this, there's a misunderstanding about, and a whole question throughout the movie about what is it that Oppenheimer said to Einstein that led him to be so dark, so dark, so black-pilled as he exited this conversation. And the whole misunderstanding is built as follows. The scientist coming into this conversation thinks that they were talking in his back. And as he sees Einstein, you know, disappointed and very sad, he assumes, oh my God, he must hate me. They must have been talking in my back. And this leads him to eventually persecute bureaucratically Oppenheimer. But what we learn at the very end, what gives us this kind of key to understand the movie, is that no, Oppenheimer wasn't talking into this guy's back. Who cares about this guy? That's why this movie is stunningly like flat and uninteresting. Who cares? <laughs> this is not big. Like As someone talked... We're talking about there, there's hundreds of people, hundreds of thousands of people who have died in Japan, blown away by just a random bomb that they didn't know was coming. They, they were going about their daily life and just suddenly a nuclear fire comes from the sky and just kills hundreds of thousands of people. And you're, you're making the whole key of your movie, did they talk in my back? Ah, uh, I think they did talk in my back. I'm going to take my revenge. <laughs> I'm going to remove the security clearance from Oppenheimer. <laughs> and this is the movie. That's, uh, it's stunning the, the kind of disconnection that Christopher Nolan had about what was the true major aspect of this movie to be had, which was the, a human and scientific aspect. And how he veered into he veered into this whole bureaucratic betrayal of oh my god, will people ever know? Will people ever know that Oppenheimer uh, was betrayed? That he didn't get quite justice in the hearing about whether he was a communist or whether he had fucked a Russian communist or not? No one gives a shit. What the fuck is this, Christopher Nolan? Anyway, so the whole end of the movie is, oh my God, we get to learn. He wasn't speaking in other scientists back. What he told Einstein is, you know the math I just, I, I passed you the other day that was showing a chain reaction? You know that, uh, that math... That was showing the possibility of a chain reaction that destroys the whole world. Well, I think we might just have started that chain reaction. And the whole idea is, 
yes, a nuclear chain reaction with, will abolish existence. But it's not going to be the atoms bumping on each other. It's going to be the humans throwing nuclear weapons at each other until everything is destroyed. It's kind of interesting, but in the background of <clears throat> in the background of oh, this whole conversation was misunderstood by another scientist, misinterpreted and paranoid about. It kind of sucks. Uh, it kind of sucks uh, that the whole the whole inversion storytelling of Christopher Nolan has been used for a thing that mixes such small and big things. Now, yeah, I am become death destroyer of worlds. Uh, that was Oppenheimer just translating some kind of other language to his mistress. And she was like, please read these words. What do they say? I am become death destroyer of worlds. It's good in a trailer, but it uh, the movie leaves me very flat at that moment. It's like... There's not much of a build-up that leads to these sentences. And you end up thinking, well, that was just a sentence inserted in the script for the trailer. And there's so many of those in uh, modern cinema where the sentence didn't really fit there in the movie, but it fit in the trailer very well. And the, the fact is you have to understand that current cinema direction in 2023 is you think of the trailer before you think of the movie. You have to have a good trailer. And Richard Spencer points this out in his analysis. Actually, the whole Oppenheimer movie feels like a, a catalog of trailers. And yes, you know, because you, you feel the Christopher Nolan injection of fascinating epic music and epic moments. But it, it feels like a trailer, but for something that never comes. <laughs> it's, a, it's like, here's, here's three hours of trailers. One after the other, each of them publicizing a movie that doesn't exist. You feel that the movie never quite comes. And that is a brilliant statement by Richard Spencer. That is exactly how I feel uh, and he, he found better words than I could have found in front of this movie. So Christopher Nolan, despite, despite the failings of this movie, he did succeed at certain things that deserve to be highlighted. So the explosion, you know, I, I, I don't think it was very successful. I, I'm not feeling it like a big thing. It's a small explosion doesn't have the, this kind of epic feeling I, I expected. You know they, how they said, oh, Christopher Nolan had to blow an actual nuclear bomb to feel the real effect. It, it barely feels like anything. It barely feels like a big explosion at all. So it, it seems that he bl he's blown a tactical nuclear weapon here, like a little grenade or something. I don't feel the the size of it. I, I it didn't didn't strike me. Like I expected to be like, oh my god, that is so big. But it's very hard to give scale in low lightning environment of a massive explosion. Like there could have been cinematic tricks to give us an idea of the scale of what's happening. <clears throat> but instead, we just see a ball of fire in nothingness, and it's like. Okay, well, is that big like one football field or is that big like 50 football fields? Very hard to tell from the explosion. Uh, Christopher Nolan succeeds at inserting the important scientific questions at play. The rise of quantum physics, the European domination of quantum physics, um the questions of quantum physics around then, around its relationship with relativity, thinking around black holes, thinking around atoms. Uh, Christopher Nolan also succeeds at showing the kind of uh, schizophrenic mind of a scientist, 
as the scientist, as Oppenheimer in this uh, movie, has visions, and the visions are very quantum physics based, and I feel that they they are very good insertions in the movie. It's like sometimes Oppenheimer just leaves the conversation, and you see little sparks. You see you see the kind of little sparks that he imagines as the foundation of the physical universe that is very well made. You see him imagining black holes and that kind of stuff, and that is also very well made. Um, it, it's very long to develop the whole, the whole one hour, the first one hour is a very scientific hour. And then it gets into a more military hour. And then the third act is a bureaucratic hour. <laughs> And the the blowing up of the bomb happens between the second and third act. But it's painful to have three hours and the whole ending of your movie is the least interesting part, the the bureaucratic aspect. Because you have the scientist and human aspect, then you have the military aspect and the, the achievement of the blowing up of the bomb, and then... Just bureaucratic betrayal team. Uh, that is a very, it's a very painful arrangement. Uh, I don't think also that one other thing that Christopher Nolan succeeds at doing is that framing relatively well that this is ultimately very tied to the Jewish question. That the those progresses and academia as a whole is basically undetachable from the question of Jewish culture. And that ultimately it was a bunch of Jewish Germans who made physics progress, a bunch of Jewish European physicists who were hiring each other in physics department of Europe, and a bunch of Jewish uh, American citizens who were bringing quantum physics to America. And it was a bunch of Jewish networks of intelligence people and scientists slash bureaucrats who were supervising those Jewish bomb makers and who were leaking their secrets to... Jewish Russian spies and you look at this whole movie and it's like why isn't this more highlighted you could have had basically the first mainstream uh, movie about the Jewish question and Christopher Nolan gets very close to it Uh, ultimately to show that the whole partnership that existed between the U.S. and Russia against Nazi Germany was a whole making of the Jews. You get this from the movie, which is already interesting. But unfortunately, Christopher Nolan, and he almost gets to the point of showing the tension between the Jewish interest and the Christian uh, nations in which they live. Because at some point, you have Pash, a uh, a military leader, and he, he kind of plays the role of you know the Nazi interrogator in *Inglorious Bastard*, the, the investigator who who can squeeze the Jews into exposing their lies and squeeze the French people who are hiding Jews below the planks. We have an equivalent uh, character in this movie, which is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pash who happens to be in the American army, but he has roots as a Christian Orthodox in Russia, and he succeeds at being the kind of incarnation of this kind of Nazi militaristic USA type of personality who ends up catching Oppenheimer in a lie. Now you ask yourself, is this movie trying to cast Oppenheimer as a victim? Well, there are parts of the movie, it's kind of, it's not clear, it's on the fence. Because part of this movie wants us to 
throws us into the interpretation that Oppenheimer was just legitimately fucking woman and should have been respected as a scientist who, who was just a lover of Jewish woman. And out there, uh, this Christian general catches him in a lie, uh, to ba which basically invades on his sexual life. And th there's a literal part where Christopher Nolan is sitting Oppenheimer in front of a bureaucratic committee. And as they question his sex life, you see he, he becomes naked. And there's a naked woman uh, having sex with him in front of the bureaucrats. Of course, it's all in his head. It's not happening for real. But that is Christopher Nolan trying to inject this, oh my God, this poor Jewish man was merely, uh, you know... Uh, living according to his own sexual freedom, how dare they invade his privacy? And there's even the Jewish wife of Oppenheimer who, who says it. It's unbelievable that they're getting into this private detail. But the fact is that he betrayed his wife. He betrayed his wife by going to fuck another woman who happened to be a Russian communist. Uh, suspected of having links to spies. And, and the movie is kind of suggesting that it's unfair to character that, that we got to this conclusion about Oppenheimer through an unjust trial. And it's not even a trial. In fact, it's a bureaucratic proceeding because it's merely a proceeding that seeks to establish whether he should keep a security clearance or not. <clears throat> and uh, it turns out that he doesn't get to keep it. Uh, and the movie doesn't even make a convincing case that we should victimize it, that he's been the victim of a deeply unfair thing here. Because it's like, you did fuck the woman, and you, you, you do have issues with your morality. You did betray a valid wife that you had committed to. Doesn't matter that you had this passion for this uh, this ex Jew uh, girlfriend that you had in the past. You have betrayed your wife, and you have done so in a way that linked you to potentially leaking secret information about the government. So I'm I'm probably one of the rare audience member here who was rooting for Pash. I was like, oh yeah, Pash, you got him, you know? You caught him in a lie. He did lie about this. Because Pash is not presented as a hero of this movie. But I, I, think, he, I think he is a necessary ingredient of this movie. Uh, and, and he should have been expanded upon. It should have been a little more excruciating for Oppenheimer to be confronted to his interrogative skills. They kind of do it, but they don't do it far enough. Again, Christopher Nolan doesn't go far enough in what's good about this movie. Uh, Armless G sends a super chat. He says, if I remember correctly, Oppenheimer's wife and mistress were ethnic German, but they were communist. His mistress was also a lesbian. His wife had been married three times before. Well, <laughs> uh... <laughs> yes but ethnic german how would they know like to me this sounds like the 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 signature behavior is mistress of a of a sex of someone who has been converted to a jewish way of life in many of the things you have highlighted so is she an ethnic German by genes? I guess we'll never know because neither did I nor did she have genetic test. But to me, her lifestyle, marrying a Jew, being Jewish, uh, you know, being a lesbian, to me that has the signature of someone who certainly had adopted the permissivity of the, the Weimar type of, of behavior. 
And so call her Jewish if you want or not. She was in such a Jewish network of communists. I will assume that she had some ties to this network until proven otherwise. So yeah, the, the movie tries to sell this whole, ah, uh, you know, maybe Oppenheimer was mistreated by uh, the bureaucrats because they were, because there was this whole anti-communist, which was secretly an anti-Semitic campaign. But I'm not moved by it at all. To the contrary, I'm like, they should have gone harder. They should have gone harder because there's a problem when you have networks of people fueled by hate. And this is, this is one aspect of the movie that could have been so much more focused on. It's there, but it's not developed again. Not enough. These Jewish physicists were absolutely adamant at producing a bomb that would be a weapons of mass destruction that could only possibly be used to kill innocent human lives. And they were working hard and hard and they were passionate about it. Why? Because it was going to kill ethnic Germans. And, oh my God, great, great tragedy. Uh, they tried to turn this into a Greek tragedy. Oh my God, my invention that was meant to kill white people ended up killing innocent Japanese people. No! It's like, you want me to cry for this? You want me to consider this whole crew has been the victim of some great injustice? That their genocide has been misdirected by the bureaucracy of the American government? This is what, this is the lesson you want me to learn, Christopher Nolan? It's fucking disgusting. You're trying to have me between the Japanese who have been killed by the hundreds of thousands, Germany that has been raped to the ground, and holy shit, it's too bad we didn't get a chance to blow them up with a nuclear bomb also. You want me, this movie wants me to cry for the Jewish physicist because he deserved to have his bomb sent to the Nazis first, not the Japanese. Well, fuck you, Christopher Nolan. Fuck you. That is it for my review of Open <laughs> Oh my god. It's a frustrating movie in many ways. It's a frustrating movie. Uh... <clears throat> I don't know what to say more than this. Uh, I didn't know that, the, that my clip reviewing this movie... I didn't know it would get so emotional. I didn't know this would be my finally. Uh, but that is what it is. That, that is the conclusion I've just reached in my head. This movie is trying to tell me that between a country ruined by war, a, another country blown and burned by nuclear fire, that there's a third victim that the, the great victim is the poor physicist whose bomb was misdirected by the president of the U.S. No! You ended up killing Japanese with it. No! It, it's offensive. All right, guys. Uh, that, uh, Greta Thunberg was... Uh, condemned uh, in Sweden for disobeying the police. Uh, her first trial for the action of blockhead that, you know, you'll remember we had seen a video of her being carried by policemen. Uh, it is true that I was there on this day and I received an order and I did not listen to the order. But I insist on denying According to me, we are in an emergency situation, and for this reason, my action was legitimate. Ah, emergency rules. The leftists love those, don't they? Thank you.
Thank you.